Okay, we're going to get into more evidence. So we're going to go to exclusion of evidence for public policy reasons. What is this going to cover? This is going to cover our outline. Our outline is going to go through Federal Rules of Evidence 407 to 411. Okay, we're going to go through each rule step by step. We're going to turn every rule into English, and we're going to make sure we understand it step at a time. Okay. So Federal Rule of Evidence 407, subsequent remedial measures. Okay, the general definition is when measures are taken that would have made an earlier injury less likely to occur, evidence of subsequent measures, measures that happen after the injury, will not be admissible to prove the following. Negligence, global conduct, defect and design of a product, or a need for instruction or warning. Okay, what does that mean? So let's just say that the uh, city has poor lighting. You have a crashing into one of their light poles because of their poor lighting. And then after that injury, once you sue them for negligence, let's say, because it is negligent for them to have poor lighting when you're driving in the streets, right? You sue for negligence. And let's say you notice that three weeks later, they are fixing the light pole and the lighting in that area is better. You cannot use that subsequent measure that um, act that they have made after the accident, after the injury, after the suit is in process as evidence against the city. That's what this rule is saying, okay? And there's an exception. The court may use that evidence, the subsequent measure, for other reasons, for a different purpose other than proving liability, such as proving ownership, control, or the feasibility of precautionary measures, okay? Proving ownership, straightforward. The city owns the pole. Control, meaning that, hey, the uh, city actually can and uh, cannot control the pole in regards to building it, fixing it up, et cetera. Another example of Rule 407 is this example. Riley's vehicle has poor brakes. Let's say Riley has a 1970 BMW, just a piece of crap car. Let's say that. He then gets to a car accident with Emily on Highway 36. So on Highway 36, Riley gets into a car crash with Emily because his, you know, has a bad car. His brakes are poor. Three weeks later, Emily notices that Riley is changing his brakes. As you can see in the picture, let's see this man right here is Riley. This is his vehicle, and these are the brand new brakes that Riley is installing into his uh, old uh, BMW. Okay, the fact that. Emily has solved that subsequent measure by Riley does not mean that she can use that evidence because again, our rule here prohibits her from using the subsequent measure as evidence to prove whether or not he was liable for negligence. Okay. The only way that she can possibly, or I mean, not, not she, but the court can use this subsequent measure that Riley is doing to his car in court is that they're trying to prove as, as we talked about control, ownership of the vehicle, and feasibility of precautionary measure. So let's move on to rule 408, compromise offers and negotiations. General rule, evidence of the following is not admissible on behalf of either the plaintiff or the defendant, either to prove or disprove the validity or amount of a disputed claim or to impeach by a prior inconsistent statement or a contradiction. Whoa. What does that mean? We'll start with number one. Number one is that basically the plaintiff or defendant cannot use statements or actions that were discussed during negotiations about the claim. Basically promises to pay, offers to accept the value consideration and compromising or attempting to compromise the claim and conduct or statements made during the compromise negotiations regarding the claim, which means that, hey, let's say that Riley and Emily, as we talked about, got into a car accident because Riley's brakes suck, right? Riley, instead of, instead of paying $10,000 for her injuries, Riley tells uh, Emily during negotiations regarding the claim that, hey, Emily, let me pay you $5,000 instead of $10,000. This is with this whole case behind us. And they discuss it, and Emily says no. And then they go to court. Emily cannot use that discussion that she had with Riley to use as evidence against him at all. Because again, that was a negotiation that they were having with 
one another in order to compromise their claim. Okay. And even if something crazy happened during negotiations, let's say that Riley punched her across the face. Let's just pretend. Let's say that happened. During their, during their uh, negotiations regarding the car crash, right, negligence claim, Emily slaps Riley or Riley slaps Emily. Neither one of them can use that evidence, that conduct that has, that has occurred as evidence to prove liability in the claim, okay? The exception to this rule is that the court may use this evidence, basically the statements and the conduct that occurred during negotiations for a different purpose. The court can use this information um, for proving liability, but it can use it for a different purpose to prove undue delay, a witness's bias or prejudice, or efforts to obstruct prosecution. So let's say that things in court are taken a lot longer than they should. Then the court would use that evidence, the conduct and the statements during negotiations um, to basically prevent undue delay. Okay, that's just an example. Okay, let's skip this example because uh, I think the Emily and Riley example are, I think that example is pretty straightforward. You can pause and you can look at this example because it's basically the same thing, but it's very similar. So federal rule of evidence 409 is offers to pay medical and similar expenses. What does that mean? The general definition is that the evidence of furnishing, promising to pay or offering to pay medical hospital or similar expenses that are similar to hospital medical resulting from an injury will not be admissible to prove liability for the harm. Okay. So let's say that Riley and Emily gets to that car crash, like I said before, and uh, Riley shows to the hospital that Emily is in because again, they got into a pretty bad car crash and Riley pays her whole entire medical bill and even pays uh, her money because she has to take time off work because she's so injured. Emily can't turn around and use that um, information of him paying her medical bills as evidence to prove his liability in court. Okay, so because Riley did a good deed, basically he won't be punished for it. It won't be used against him in court. Another example of similar to what I just said, heaven intentionally made Rebecca suffer severe emotional distress. Heaven offers to pay Rebecca's medical bills, okay? Rebecca cannot use this fact to prove liability in court. So she can't use that fact that having paid her medical bills to say that, hey court, she paid my medical bills, therefore this is, a, this is another fact or piece of evidence that you should, you know, that you should not consider in proving my claim against, uh, against her, okay? Rebecca can't do that. So rule four, Ten, pleas, plea discussions, and related and related claims. This is very similar to Rule Four Hundred Eight. This is a situation where, in a civil or criminal case, evidence of the following is not admissible against a defendant who made a plea or participated in the plea discussions: a guilty plea, literal drawn, which means that the defendant in the prosecution has successfully made a uh, plea bargain but the defendant has withdrawn a plea bargain, which means that the statements made during that plea bargain discussion will not be used against the defendant. Number two, a no contest plea. Number three, a statement made during a plea or plea discussions with the prosecutor that did not result in a guilty plea or later or drawn guilty plea. Like I just said earlier, basically the prosecutor can't use statements that he or she made with the defendant when they were discussing a guilty plea that was withdrawn because the uh, defendant wants to take it up to trial, let's say. An exception to this rule is statements admitted by, you know, statements will be admitted by the defendant um, if the defendant lies under oath, on the record, and with counsel present. Example, let's say the defendant uh, is uh, wanting to be a witness to what happened. He takes the stand. He takes an oath. He's on the record. Counsel is there. His lawyer is there. The prosecutor is there. The jury and the judge are there. And the defendant lies under oath. That is a situation where the defendant's statements will be used against him. Simple as that. An example of rule 410 is Israel, the defendant, 
robs a bank and he's charged with robbery. Israel and his attorney have a plea discussion with the prosecutor and gets a plea deal for larceny. So instead of Israel getting robbery, him and his attorney have a plea discussion with the prosecutor to get larceny. That is the plea agreement. Okay. Israel later withdraws the plea because his attorney here, as you can see in the picture, is whispering in his ears saying, you want to know what? I think we can beat this case. Let's take it to trial. Okay. Then, as, as you can see in the example, Israel later withdraws the plea. The prosecutor cannot use Israel's statements made during the plea discussion against him in court because he withdrew the plea. Lastly, Federal Rule of Evidence 411, Liability Insurance. This is probably the easiest rule in my opinion. Evidence that a person was or was not insured against liability is not admissible to prove whether the person acted negligently or otherwise wrongfully. So that means that, again, let's use Emily and Riley. Emily and Riley get into a car accident and Riley did not have uh, liability insurance. He didn't have insurance in his car at all, okay? Emily cannot use that as evidence to prove that he acted negligently or wrongfully when he hit her, right? So that is a situation where Emily's out of luck. She can't use the fact that he did not have insurance against him to prove that he was liable for negligence or acted otherwise wrongfully. The exception to this rule is that the court may admit this evidence for a different purpose, not to prove liability, but for a totally different purpose in order to prove a witness's bias or prejudice, control, agency, or ownership. Okay, so let's say that while he did in fact have uh, liability insurance, let's say he did during the car crash, the court can use that liability insurance as evidence to say, okay, Riley, look, you own this car. Your name is clearly on the insurance. We see that the insurance not only has your name, but the kind of car you drive, and that car you, you drove is on the insurance. You own this car. That is how the court can use uh, Riley's insurance for a different purpose that is not uh, proving an element of, of a negligence. One more example of Rule 411 is that Mohammed, the manager of Pizza Hut, tells Kalen, the Pizza Boy employee, to deliver pizzas, okay? Muhammad manager telling Kalen, the employee, to go deliver pizzas. Happens all, all the time, every day. Kalen uses his own truck, not Muhammad's car, but Kalen uses his own truck that is not insured. And then Kalen crashes his car into James. James then sues Muhammad for negligence. The evidence will be included in this situation because Muhammad was negligent in allowing his employee who's on duty to deliver pizzas by using his own vehicle who that's not even insured. So that'll be a situation where the evidence will be included. Because again, Muhammad was the one driving the car, Kalen was. So the evidence of Kalen being uninsured will be admitted. Okay, because again, James is suing Muhammad. James is not suing Kalen. If James was suing Kalen, then Kalen having insurance or not would not be admitted as evidence to prove liability. But because James is suing Muhammad, the fact that Kalen was not insured will be admitted into evidence. Therefore, know the rules cold. Know the rules cold and understand why they exist in order to memorize them. As I always say, flashcards, repeating it out loud, and watching through this video will help you understand exactly what these rules mean step by step. Okay, if you have any questions, comment below.